Today we're going to look at a which is larger type question and we're actually going to broaden this question to a family of examples and give you a strategy for finding the answer to the question in a lot of different situations. So we'll start with the toy example that which one is larger, phi to the square root of 2 versus square root of 2 to the phi. And by phi of here, I mean the golden ratio. So I mean 1 half times 1 plus the square root of 5. In other words, it is the positive root of the equation x squared equals x plus 1. Okay, and what I mean by a broader version of this question is answering which one is larger, x to the y or y to the x, if x and y are both positive. So it gets a little trickier even when this question is well defined if x and y are negative. Okay, so let's get to it. And determining our general strategy will require us to use the following trick. And that is that a to the power b is the same thing as a to the power 1 over a all to the power a b. So something like that. I think that's pretty clear how that works. Okay, but notice that that allows us to say that x to the y is bigger than y to the x precisely when x to the 1 over x raised to the xy is bigger than y to the 1 over y to the xy. But since x and y are both positive, this inequality holds exactly when the inequality of the terms in the parentheses hold. So in other words, this is equivalent to x to the power 1 over x is bigger than y to the power 1 over y. Okay, and now let's bring this down. So we've got a like really nice way to test this which is larger question. So notice we have that x to the power y is bigger than y to the power x if and only if x to the 1 over x is bigger than y to the 1 over y. So that really inspires the study of the following function. So let's consider the function given by, I'll call it f of x, and it will be x to the 1 over x. Great. And notice that this inequality right here can be rewritten in the following form at this point. We have x to the y is bigger than y to the x if and only if f of x is bigger than f of y. So we've put our goal inequality into this like functional inequality setup. But perhaps this functional inequality setup is easier to determine based on if the function is increasing, decreasing, where its maximums and minimums are and such. So that statement inspires us to try to find the maximum and the intervals of increasing and decreasing. Okay, so how do we find the maximum? Well, we do that by finding the derivative. So let's find the derivative of this object. But that's a little tricky given that we've got an exponential type function where the base and the exponent both have variables. So our general strategy here is to employ what's called logarithmic differentiation in order to find the derivative. So if we take the log of both sides, we'll see that the natural log of f of x is exactly 1 over x times the natural log of x using logarithm rules. And now we can take the derivative, and that'll leave us with f prime of x over f of x equals, well, we've got to use the product rule over here on the left-hand side. We'll have 1 over x squared from taking the derivative of the natural log of x, and then we'll have minus natural log of x over x squared from taking the derivative of 1 over x. So in the end, that gives us a nice formula for the derivative. Notice that f prime of x is exactly equal to x to the 1 over x over x squared times 1 minus the natural log of x. That's after moving some things around. Okay, so now if we wish to 
find the maximum, we, we need to set the derivative equal to zero. Let's recall that maximums occur at critical points. And critical points are where the derivative is zero or does not exist. But since we're only interested in positive inputs here, this derivative will always exist, which means we really just need to find out where the derivative is equal to zero. Okay, so let's see. If this equation is equal to zero, that tells us that the natural log of x is equal to one, which in turn tells us that x is equal to e. Okay, and then it's like fairly easy to check that f of x is increasing up to e and decreasing from e. And that allows us to draw the following nice picture. So this will be the graph of f of x. So let's put e right here maybe. And then we'll have this thing has a, like I said, a local maximum at e. I think it's asymptotic to zero right here. And then it'll decrease from there. And that's actually like pretty easy to check because if we're to the left of e, we're between zero and e. But that'll give you a positive value for f prime. But getting a positive value for f prime means it's increasing. And then if we're larger than e, we'll get a negative value for f prime, so that means we're decreasing. So this is the kind of setup that we have right here. Notice this point right here would be of the form e, and then e to the one over e, and that is the maximum. Okay, so building a nice summary, we have the following data. So f of x is increasing on the interval zero to e, and then f of x has a maximum at x equal to e, and then finally f of x is decreasing on the interval e to infinity. But that actually allows us to determine the answer to our question very easily. And that's by noticing that phi is larger than the square root of two. I'll let you maybe do a basic calculation to do that. That's not too hard to do. So that means we have the square root of two over here. We have phi over here. But like I said, that puts phi and the square root of two in this region where f of x is increasing, which tells us that in fact, f of the square root of two must be less than f of phi. So now using this result that we added in, we'll see that in fact, phi to the square root of two is less than square root of two to the phi. Okay, so that's like our little warm up result over here. Now let's look more broadly at this type of question. Let's look at what we've seen so far. We showed that the golden ratio to the power square root of two is in fact less than the square root of two to the golden ratio. And more broadly, we proved the following result. That if x is less than y, which is less than or equal to e, then x to the y is less than y to the x. And furthermore, if e is less than or equal to x is less than y, then x to the y is bigger than y to the x. And our result is a case of this first one, but maybe the classic YouTube result that e to the pi is bigger than pi to the e is a classic version of the second one. That's because we've got pi out here to the right of e. Whereas like in our case, we've got everything to the left of e. But I guess that really brings up the following obvious question, and that is, what if x and y straddle e? So in other words, we have x is less than e is less than y. And I found this result, and this was a result that was posted on the Stack Exchange, but the author, M. Cohen, said that he had proven it somewhere, but didn't furnish a proof. I, in fact, just checked a bunch of cases and it seemed to be okay. Maybe if anyone knows the proof of this or can briefly sketch it in the comments, go ahead and do so. What it says if, is that if one is less than x, is less than e, is less than y, and x times y is bigger than e squared, then x to the y is less than y to the x. 
And notice we can immediately use that to prove the following result. And that is comparing phi to the tau versus tau to the phi. And what is tau? Well, tau we're going to take to be 2 pi. So some people out there in internet world like greatly prefer tau over pi, but I don't know that anyone thinks about that in the real world. Okay, so first of all, we want to notice that phi is less than 2, and 2 is less than e, and e is less than, well, 6, which in turn is less than tau. So that means we in fact have phi and tau straddling e. I guess maybe I should also write here that phi is bigger than 1. And now we just have to look at phi times tau and make sure that's bigger than e squared. So let's check that. So phi times tau. Well, let's write out what phi is. So it's 1 half, 1 plus the square root of 5. And then tau is 2 times pi. And now let's do some simplifications. So this 2 and this 2 can cancel. And then we can replace the square root of 5 with the square root of 4, giving us 1 plus the square root of 4. And we can replace pi with 3. And I should say both of those replacements have pushed me into a smaller object because pi is bigger than 3 and 5 is bigger than 4. Okay, so anyway, this is going to be equal to 3. So in the end, we have 3 times 3, which is 9. But 9 is fairly clearly bigger than e squared because e is less than 3. Okay, so we have our setup. So now we can apply this theorem and we have our result. And that says that phi to the tau is in fact bigger than tau to the phi. Okay, nice. And I guess maybe where should we leave this? I'll leave us with the following question. And that is to compare the following. What about phi to the pi versus pi to the power phi? So notice this satisfies part of the hypothesis here. We have one is less than phi, which is less than e, which is less than pi, but it does not satisfy the other portion of the hypothesis. In fact, here we have phi times pi is less than e squared. I won't check that carefully, but you can check that it's less than e squared. But notice that this result, as written, doesn't say anything about the case when this inequality is not satisfied. So I think maybe another strategy must be used to determine this. And also post in the comments if you have an idea for that strategy. And maybe I'll make a, either a follow-up full video or a short about these types of generalizations of these types of problems that don't fit this nice setup over here. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.